All right, hello, autoimmune warriors. I'm Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the relationship between gluten and autoimmunity, and I'll also discuss whether or not everyone should test for a gluten sensitivity. Speaking of testing, the main reason I've put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions better understand the test results so that they can find and remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. All right, so before I talk about the relationship between gluten and autoimmunity, I'd like to briefly discuss what gluten is. So gluten is a mixture of prolamine proteins present mostly in wheat, but is also found in barley, rye, and oats. So gliadin is the most problematic protein found in gluten, specifically wheat. I also want to briefly talk about the difference between celiac disease and a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I'm not gonna get into great detail, and with the next video, I'm gonna talk more about testing for gluten, the different tests for gluten. So you have a better understanding when you go through that video. But celiac disease is an autoimmune condition and gluten is the trigger. So when someone has celiac disease, you need to avoid gluten permanently. So as far as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, many will also suggest that you avoid gluten permanently. I mean, the truth is we probably all should avoid gluten permanently, but if you have celiac disease, no question you should avoid gluten on a permanent basis. If you have a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you probably still should avoid gluten on a, on a permanent basis. Uh, again, everybody in, in a perfect world, we all would avoid gluten on a permanent basis. With non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's, it does involve the immune system. Any sense, food sensitivity involves the immune system. It's just not an autoimmune process. And again, I'll talk more about the different testing options for gluten, specifically gluten sensitivity with the next video. Not really going to get into detail with celiac disease with the next video. So the question you might have is, can gluten trigger an autoimmune condition other than celiac disease? So again, we established that a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that's not an autoimmune condition. And, and obviously celiac disease is, but can gluten cause other autoimmune conditions? Most natural healthcare practitioners would say yes, including myself, just because we've seen people. I know I've seen people where they avoid gluten and go into remission. Unfortunately, that's not the case with most people, but there are some people that have conditions other than celiac disease where they avoid gluten and, and they're, they're in remission, their autoantibodies normalize, their symptoms go away. So how can eating gluten cause autoimmunity? Well, there's a, a few different ways. So there's what's called molecular mimicry is one way, which again, it's still, I think more of a theory. It's then been, been proven, but so the peptide sequences of foods such as wheat. So these could be similar to those of human molecules, human amino acids, and this similarity can result in a cross reactivity. So let's give an example. Some say that the, that gluten actually has a structure similar, an amino acid sequence similar to that of the thyroid gland. And so the immune system gets confused. Instead of attacking gluten, it attacks the thyroid gland. So if someone's sensitive, someone's reacting to gluten, it will react to gluten, but also the, it'll react to the thyroid gland. That's, that's an example of molecular mimicry. Again, a bit of a gray area. And another way where gluten can potentially cause an autoimmune condition is by causing a leaky gut. In 2015, a study came out that showed that gluten potentially causes a leaky gut in everyone. And so according to the triad of autoimmunity, you have three components, genetic predisposition, exposure to environmental trigger, and an increase in intestinal permeability, which is the medical term for a leaky gut. So in this case, the leaky gut isn't the main trigger. You still need another environmental trigger, but it could be a factor in a leaky gut. So Either way, whether a leaky gut could be the main trigger whether, or whether it is the main trigger in certain autoimmune conditions other than celiac disease, or if it's a leaky gut trigger, if it can cause a leaky gut, ideally you want to avoid gluten, especially if you have an autoimmune condition. All right, so also it's important to understand that not having symptoms doesn't rule out a gluten sensitivity. So if you feel fine with eating gluten, it doesn't mean that gluten's fine. Again, I just mentioned that gluten causes a leaky gut in everyone regardless, but I'm talking also about, not, I'm not talking about a leaky gut here, I'm talking about a sensitivity. So it's possible to have a sensitivity to gluten and not be symptomatic when you're eating gluten. Some people, they might not have digestive symptoms, but might have neurological symptoms, including headaches. So again, it depends on the person, but just because you feel fine when eating gluten 
Um, and that describes me. I've been in remission since 2009 with Graves, from my Graves' disease condition. And I can't say I've been 100% gluten-free since then, but I definitely minimize uh, it before then, before I was dealing with Graves, I ate gluten on a regular basis. And so I definitely limit it. Definitely, uh, don't eat it in the home. And even when outside of the home, usually don't eat it. But again, I can't say I completely av- avoid it. But when, when I get exposed to gluten, I don't feel bad, but it doesn't mean it's not having a negative impact on my health. It doesn't mean that I'm not playing with fire because it, it can potentially play a role in myself relapsing, the grave disease, maybe not by itself, maybe other factors, maybe in my case, it'll cause a leaky gut and I need a, an environmental trigger, but still it's, it's something you just, the point is don't just assume that you don't have a problem with gluten because you feel fine when you eat gluten. And of course, if the opposite is true, is if you're having symptoms when you're eating gluten, then you want to avoid gluten. Uh, just recently, I had a patient who was experiencing digestive symptoms when eating gluten, but instead of listening to her body, she continued to, to eat it. <laughs> so if, if you have symptoms, in a way, that's good. I mean, some people think it's nice when they don't have symptoms. And admittedly, sometimes I feel that way as well. If I get exposed, I'm, I'm glad I'm not experiencing symptoms. But In a way, it's good when you do experience symptoms because that's your body's way of telling you that you should avoid it. And that's probably the case with everybody. So it would be, it probably would be great if everybody had symptoms. But so if you, if you, but if you have digestive symptoms when eating any type of food, I would avoid that food. But since we're talking about gluten here, if you're experiencing symptoms when eating gluten, avoid gluten. (laughs) And then some will ask, is eating a small amount of gluten okay? So even a tiny little bit of gluten. (laughs) So it depends on who you ask, but if you ask those who do research on the effects of gluten, they will say, don't eat any gluten. (laughs) If you ask someone who doesn't do a lot of research and it's just their opinion, then they might say having a small amount of gluten is okay. The, The truth is everybody's different though. So if someone has celiac disease, then a small amount of gluten is not okay. If someone has a non celiac gluten sensitivity, Again, it's still debatable, probably probably best not to have gluten. Some will say if the gut's healed, if you avoid if you have a gluten sensitivity that's not related to celiac disease and you avoid gluten for a prolonged period of time, you heal the gut, then maybe you could have a small amount of gluten every now and then, and that might be the case. You know, if you have, we'll talk about if someone has, let's say, an existing autoimmune condition and they're not in remission. So let's let's talk about that situation. Because again, I have a small amount of gluten every now and then, and I, I, I was diagnosed with Graves, but I'm in remission, and I do okay, even though, like I said, I might be playing with fire. But, but as I also mentioned, it's not something like every day or every week or even every month I'm you know, eating gluten. It's just, as I said, I have not been 100% gluten-free in the 10 plus years since I've been in remission. But if someone is dealing with an autoimmune condition, a small amount of gluten can cause problems. Now, again, there, there are some people that could get away with eating gluten. The problem is we don't know who those people are. So you are taking a risk and, and you can't always go by symptoms. So if someone's eating glu- a small amount of gluten for a few months and they're not progressing after a few months, you know, let's say they're trying to do things to improve their health, which hopefully you are since you're watching these videos. So if, if you're trying to improve your health and you're eating a small amount of gluten and maybe everything else is great, you're you know, avoiding other common allergens, but just have a tiny amount of gluten. And if two or three months go by and you're not improving, now we don't know for sure if gluten's the problem, but since gluten can definitely cause a leaky gut and then some people can be a trigger or people can be, be sensitive even without symptoms, then if someone's not improving after a few months, I would say it's still a good idea to avoid gluten. And then so another question, which relates to what I was talking about, can you eat gluten after being in remission? So it depends on the person. Some people might hear my story and say, hey, I've I've eaten some gluten since being in remission. But again, a reminder that it's not something I eat regularly. And, you know, there's been some times when I've fallen off the wagon going on on vacation, let's say, even then I still try to be good, but it might be more than a single exposure. But it's not like for weeks on end, it's not like, come Thanksgiving and you know the holiday season that for six weeks I'm eating gluten. So it really, de- you know, so again, it depends on the person as far as re- whether or not they can reintroduce gluten after being remission. 
you know, some people can get away with it, some people can't, but you are taking a risk. When I reintroduced gluten for the first time after being in remission, I didn't know how it would respond. And same thing, I mean, it could be eventually there's what's called, you know, the, the, the so-called straw that breaks the camel's back. Maybe eventually, even if I only have it every now and then, you know, all it takes is one time. So in a perfect world, ideally, what, what a lot of healthcare practitioners, I guess in a perfect world, again, everybody would avoid gluten, but Ideally, if someone has an autoimmune condition, probably a good idea to give up gluten forever. Same thing with me, but like I said, I'm not perfect, and every now and then I'll get exposed. And there are some people that do a great job, better than I do. So there, there are some people that with autoimmunity, they have given up gluten forever, and they haven't had gluten, any gluten for years. There are some people that don't think they had gluten, but they really have because of cross-contamination. And then there are some people that wonder, is the problem with glyphosate? and not gluten. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. And, you know, there are some stories about people who have traveled to different countries and they ate gluten in other countries and they did fine. But then as soon as they came back to the United States and ate, you know, bread and pasta with gluten, of course, there are gluten-free versions of those. But, you know, but for those who ate the gluten versions, uh, they, they had reactions in the United States, but not outside the United States. It's possible that could be due to glyphosate. Honestly, at this point, we're not sure. There's also hybridization, which I'm not going to get into here, but hybridization of wheat could also be a factor maybe, but um, there's a, for more information on that, there's a book called Wheat Belly that you might want to read. But I would say to try to avoid both. Try to avoid gluten as much as you can and try to, of course, avoid glyphosate. Try to eat organic as much as you can and minimize your exposure to glyphosate. So next question, should you test for a gluten sensitivity? So that's what the next video will focus on, but I will tell you here that anyone with an autoimmune condition who's eat, currently eating gluten probably should get tested for celiac disease. Just once you stop eating gluten, you can't test for a gluten sensitivity. You need gluten in your system in order to produce antibodies for gluten, whether it's celiac or a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So probably a good idea to do a celiac panel. Uh, as far as some of the other testing for gluten that I'll talk about in the next video, I can't say that I commonly have people do the testing that I'm going to discuss again in the next video. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I usually just tell people to stop eating gluten. Now, of course, one of the benefits is if, you're, if you test for a gluten sensitivity and if you're positive, then that might make you decide. You might, based on those results, you might decide never to eat gluten again, even if you're feeling okay when eating gluten. So there are there's some benefit of testing for for a gluten sensitivity. But with any with everything else, you just got to if you have it in your budget and you want to test for that, that's fine. But you need to draw the line somewhere. Even though I'm, I'm a big advocate of testing, usually what I just do is tell people to stop eating gluten. But again, I usually do recommend uh, over the last few years, I can't say I've done this for the last 10 years, but over the last few years, I recommend celiac testing, doing a celiac panel. I do recommend it as an optional test just because again, trying to prioritize. And maybe there are some that will well, argue it should be a priority. There, there are some practitioners that say that everybody with autoimmunity should test for celiac disease, even if you don't feel like you, there is silent celiac disease. So even if you're not experiencing symptoms, you still might have silent celiac disease. So maybe I should make it a mandatory test, or obviously it's up, still up to the person. Even if I put it as not optional, it's, it's still up to the person to get the test. But just something to keep in mind. But be on the lookout for my next video where we'll discuss the different ways to test for a gluten sensitivity. Again, more so the sensitivity and not really getting, getting into celiac disease, even though some of the testing, some of the markers will relate to celiac disease. If you have any questions related to gluten and autoimmunity, please post them in the comment section below and I'll catch you in the next video.